Hi everybody, welcome to a Kickstarter preview video. This is a preview in a sense that I have played it a few times, both solo and multiplayer. I'm going to give my thoughts on it, both pros and cons, but this isn't a formal review of the game because this is currently running on Kickstarter right now. It is a prototype copy, even though it is kind of near final by the looks of it. And of course, there will be some tweaking to the rules and the game and the components, I'm sure, before it gets sent out for retail. But I still want to give you my honest thoughts about this game. So they've donated me a copy of this and I've given it the beans in terms of multiplayer and solo play which is being designed by David Digby and I've seen some buzz going around for this game, you know other channels have covered this, you know Rado did the video as well and there's been a lot of praise for this. Surprisingly few flaws have been mentioned which kind of worries me a little bit because this game is pretty good as a, you know, a general overview but there are some issues that I do have with it, so it's kind of a mixed bag. So to give a brief summary of the rules in Ahau, that is how you pronounce it, I have checked the rule book, it tells you this, rulers of Yucatan, you have basically your vying for area control on this board while summoning various gods with special abilities to build up your pyramid full of tiles or buildings, gain the most victory points and of course win with the most of them, of course. In this game, you have two phases, a movement and an action phase. Each of you has a hand of cards, number from one to six, and you essentially pick two of them in secret and put them face down, one to the left of your pyramid and one to the right. The left one is the region where you're gonna put your ruler piece, which is effectively where do you wanna take your turn. The right card is the strength of your ruler while it's there, because only one ruler can be in a region at any one time. So you flip them simultaneously and you check to see if there's any conflicts with any of the rulers like sharing places. You compare the strength strength of the two war cards as well as any particular weapon tiles that you might have picked up during the game. The highest gets to advance up a war track and get more bonuses but stay where they are. The loser gets a weapon token so they get more powerful later on and get to move to a neighboring region. So they don't necessarily get to go where they wanted to go but they still get a consolation prize. It's not quite in your face combat and granted it's much better to level up the war track than it is to just get a weapon tile but it's not like oh Oh, I got hit in combat, my turn is over and I get nothing. You know, it's not like that. While in your region, you grab one of the pyramid tiles that is there and keep it in your reserve because you can use it for one or two things. You then have four different actions you can do on your turn. Firstly, you have to put a little meeple worker in a neighboring city. It's important because one, it's area control for points. Secondly, it also dictates what resources they can produce for you depending on what's nearby, whether it's a farm or coffee or anything like that. But then also it dictates which god you are trying to summon for the term. So I could put it on here, for example, on the rain god, Shaq, I think he's called, yeah, Shaq, the rain god. And you then have the option to summon them. And when summoning a god, it's basically based on the summoning strength, which is the amount of pyramid tiles you have in your pyramid with that god's face on it, regardless of color, plus any tiles of that god you want to discard. So this is what I mean about having them in reserve. When you do that, you dictate what strength the action is and you get to do whatever action that particular god does and there's five of them so there's a good amount of variety in the powers and you'll look at them and think oh, I don't know, that one seems a lot better than that one at first but then when you actually think about it and go through the game you realize that all of them are pretty good in specific ways you just need to know when and where to use them now you could spend most of the game focusing on one maybe two gods or you could diversify and try and activate them all every turn they just won't be as powerful for you both strategies seem to work quite well after summoning the god, if you have a pyramid tile in your pyramid with that face on it, you get to put one of your markers on one of these temple tiles. Now, there's no temple here, we'll get onto that in a minute, but basically this is kind of like a, in a sense, a scoring opportunity. Your game is played over three rounds, for, for the maximum of three rounds, and at the end of a round there is a celebration where you do some scoring. These temples score in different ways each game, and the idea is, is that based on what the leading player of that particular criteria has. So let's say it's score points equal the number of resources. You then check to see which player has the most resources. It's player A with seven. And then everybody who has a marker on that temple scores seven points, regardless of whether that person who has seven resources is on the temple themselves. So it's kind of like check who's got the most of something and then see who's got the marker to score points. So getting on these temples is um, kind of important. Again, we'll get onto that a bit later. After that, you have the choice of whether to build or produce. If you produce, you simply deplete the tile, which goes onto a kind of round calendar. It's basically a timer to see when the round ends, and you get a bunch of cubes which dictate the resources. If you build, you simply pay the resource cost on your pyramid or on the building tile, 
and you build it on your board. Buildings give you different effects, the pyramid tiles not only give you bonuses when you overlap things, but mainly it's to channel the power of the gods, as well as accelerate the game end, because the game can also end when you have placed all your workers, or when somebody's completed the whole pyramid. And then finally, you simply look at your hand of cards, have you got less than two remaining, you draw the rest up. But technically, it means that when you've got six cards, you take three turns and then you draw your cards back. But there are some extra cards that you can get, these roll cards, which basically is a, a special power associated with that number. So you might be able to grab one of these during the game and thus you'll have seven cards to pick from rather than six. These are pretty sweet. Do not ignore them. Ignore them at your own peril, that's all I can say. But you basically keep going like this. Every time the round ends, as in the full, like, they call it a cartoon, an era, basically. As soon as that all ends, you go to the scoring, and then you reset the board, go again. And basically, until one of the endgame scoring triggers happens, you just carry on summoning gods, triggering powers, building tiles, until the game end is triggered, and then the most victory points wins. Of course! Now, components, I can only talk so much about them, because obviously this is a Kickstarter prototype, but... In terms of the component quality, this is kind of what you're going to get. You're going to get a bunch of tiles with these cool little pictures on them. Nothing like crazy in the cardboard thickness, but, you know, they work. You're going to get little meeple workers. You're going to get a standee for your ruler. I mean, let's face it, we don't really need a miniature here. And you get some pretty decent boards. And you get these temples. Now, these temples are a mixed bag. Because if you can see from the photo, they look cool when they're set up. When they're set up, they basically come in this very, like, sort of flimsy cardboard and you have to basically put the sides together which is you know easier said than done then you have to insert them into this board here and then you have to put this little bit on top to say which god it is and then this scoring tile at the front okay do that five times just to set up the game what do these temples do they sit there and tell you which temple is which god that's literally it looks cool but after the first game i stopped bothering to set the things up I really think that they should be like one plastic piece. One plastic piece with the god's face on it and you, then you could have the scoring tile in front of it or on top of it or whatever like plugged into the top to say what it scores as. That would be fine and a cool Kickstarter stretch goal. But I lost the will to live having to assemble these five temples every single game. That just got a little bit annoying because you can't keep them together unless you're willing to glue them I guess and shove them in the box. But well, I suppose you could do that but I shouldn't have to. But artwork-wise, gorgeous. This is really nice art. When you look on the board, it's got very nice picturesque landscape of the trees, the fields, the temples, the towers, the water. Everything pops on this board. Even your player boards are pretty sweet. It's got a kind of like sunset with like a pyramid base, statue faces, trees and that. It's really good. You know, this is pretty much final artwork as far as I'm aware, and it looks lovely. Now, the board does get a little bit on the busy side, though, because you've got to set up all those hexagon tiles, you've got to set up all the production tiles, then you got your rulers on there, then you've got pyramid tiles taking up spaces, then you've got to put a building in each region to say that this is a bonus when you surround it with workers. By the time you've got all that done, you're not seeing a huge amount of the board anymore. It's kind of all, like, busy. So the gameplay, the mechanics... There is a lot of good stuff here, I've got to admit. This is essentially a midweight Euro, although it is creeping up to that heavy side because of the complexity of having five separate powers, the roll cards, the building effects, having like to customize what pyramid tiles you get. You know, are you going to strengthen this god or strengthen the, a few of them a little bit at a time? Putting the colors next to each other scores you more points. You know, there's quite a little bit to juggle here. And that's before you even get to these temples and their scoring. It is a quite a bit but it's very engaging the the favorite part for me is those god powers the five god powers which granted you might think one or two of them are more powerful than the others but they're all situational in their own right you one or two of them may be more useful every turn but then there's one two or three of them in there which are useful really useful like really powerful when triggered at the right time so none of them are i would say rubbish powers you've just got to get used to them but it is cool to be able to go, right, I'm in this region, I could activate one of these god powers. Who's surrounding this region? Well, there are rain gods there, so there's a dragon god, a Kalkulkan or whatever, and then uh, it's Zamu and a jaguar god. It's like, oh, I don't know, do I want them this round? Well, if I put a meeple there, how many tiles have I got? Two. I could discard a couple more, that'd be strength four, and then I could do all this really cool stuff. It It's a lot of turns of building up the combos with those god powers, and it's easily the best 
part. Using those gold powers to your advantage and getting your tokens on those temples. In fact, that is paramount. You will not win this game if you don't adhere to these temples. And that is a bit of a flaw because I was kind of hoping that you could really diversify and go for really different strategies. And you sort of can, because going focusing on a particular god over another will certainly influence your play style. But at the end of the day, you are going to need these temples. These temples score you so many points that you will never be able to make up that many points with anything else in the game, even the gods who actually allow you to score points for doing what they do or for completing your pyramid and buildings. It just they don't equate to anything close to what these temples can get you. So it does make the progression of the game a little bit on the linear side, but it's still engaging. It's still fun to, you know, kind of second guess your opponent. Like, do I want to go to that region? Yes. How much do I really want to go to that region? A lot? Well, I better play a high strength card, but then they've played their high ones, they've played their high ones. I reckon I could win this, it shouldn't be too bad. We'll go with it, let's uh, move into there. Then that movement phase is done and then you're back to comboing powers and using these roll cards and building up your pyramid in whichever way you kind of see fit. It's all really cool. Now there is a bit of a downtime between turns, that is a bit of a problem, and especially when you get to four or five players, this is very noticeable. Because yes, the movement phase is simultaneous, but that's done and dusted within about 10 seconds. It really isn't a difficult phase to do. So then you have to go in region one, region two, region three in order, and do whoever's in there, their entire action in full. So they've got to place their worker, then they've got to decide what they're doing with their god, decide on the strength, resolve the god power, and then they've got to decide whether they're producing or building. Producing is pretty quick, but then building's like, well, I want to build that there, that scores me this many points, or I could build this here, that would score me that, and then sort out their cards. Get on with it. They've got to do that before the next player takes their turn, before the next player takes their turn, and a bit like Grand Austria Hotel, you get a little bit of a snake effect, where in one round, I decide to go to region one. I get to act first, fantastic. Next round I go to region 5, I act last. So I've got to wait from between region 1 in the first round to region 5 in the second round before I take the rest of my turn. It's a little bit, uh, it does get pretty grating in terms of downtime. Not so much noticed with two or three players, but with four or five, I was definitely noticing the length. So in a two to three player game, you're lucky if you ever conflict with each other. In a two player game, you could practically go most of the game without ever seeing a war. In a three player game, I was able to go two full eras without ending up in a conflict. Well, I like war, but I wouldn't say I love it. But in a four or five player game, it's nigh on impossible to avoid a conflict. In a five player game, you will get one, maybe two conflicts happening every turn. Yeah, you can have somebody in one, two, three, four, and five individually, but you wanna work out the odds of that happening? It doesn't happen very often. You're pretty much fighting constantly. And that can get a little bit annoying as well, especially if you're on the receiving end of it a lot. Just give us a head, you son of a Yes, you get these weapon tokens to boost up your strength, but again, moving up that war track gets you much better bonuses than a little bit of strength. And so, again, it also elongates the game, and it's already making the game probably a bit too long than I would like in a four or five player setup. But going back to those play styles that I mentioned, there are some very unique ways that you can play. Are you going to focus entirely on building up this pyramid? Well, then you're going to be really having fun with those god powers. And to be honest, the pyramid's the way I like to play this game. I love building up the pyramid and I love triggering those god powers with all sorts of different like types and strengths. But you could focus on buildings, but then I don't find that really gets you a huge amount of points. The buildings are nice. I mean, when you get a couple, you get some bonuses and that, but... The most you score for the buildings is basically seven points if you can do all five, and they give you some cool abilities, but all the while that you're building buildings, you're not really building up your pyramid, which is how you trigger a lot of the god powers. And so I feel like you're kind of wasting a bunch of resources on something that's probably better spent elsewhere. So I rarely find myself doing the buildings. Now, again, some of them are cool effects, but you know, overall I prefer to just build up a pyramid. The different gods though, one of them gets you more tokens out the bag, so you can focus a lot on that. One gets you more cubes from a site, again very useful. But one has you moving your workers around the different cities. 
And that's more useful than you think, because surrounding a region gets you a free building tile, which you can nick before someone else does. But on top of that, when you place a worker down on a city, the number of workers you have there dictates how much you're allowed to build in terms of tiles. So put a worker down on somewhere where you've already got three workers, now there's four, you can build four tiles. You could build like a ton in a turn if you've got the cubes for it. The Jaguar is very good for setting that kind of stuff up. The Sun God allows you to take back cards, which at first doesn't sound great, but you do get a couple of points for summoning them with different colors. And if you are summoning your big high strength cards back, then you're looking good to win a few more wars because you can constantly keep playing them out. Of course, if you get one of these really cool roll cards, which are stupid powerful in some cases, then being able to regurgitate that on a frequent basis is really gonna propel you forward. Do not underestimate these things if you can get a roll card. And then the final one is just basically remove a worker and get points. But it gets you a decent amount of points. Not enough to make it the full strategy of the game and win, but it certainly will get you a decent amount of points when you need it, if you just need to boost yourself up, or if that's the god you happen to be triggering. You can stack a bunch of that particular god up, with the dragon hit, I think he is, and score a lot in a turn, but you're going to run out of workers. You're going to have to place out workers at some stage, and so... It's not a strategy in itself, but it is a cool nifty power now and again. The game quotes on the box 90 to 120 minutes, and that is accurate if you're playing with two or three players. I played this with four and five, and it definitely took longer than the two hour time frame. You're talking two and a half hours easily with four, possibly even longer with five if it's your first game, but you could probably get a five player game down to two and a half hours if you're quick. But yeah, it does outstay its welcome a bit by the time it gets to that two hour mark because you are kind of rinse and repeating each round and the only thing that's really changing is how strong your actions get, not the stuff that happens in the game itself. So I kind of wish this capped at two hours absolute max and was more around the 90 minute mark, which you can achieve with a two or three player game. I think three is a pretty good sweet spot for this game. You don't get a ton of conflicts, but you get some and you get like the game goes along at a quicker pace. Now the solo mode, which is done by David Digby, is actually pretty solid, in fact, to the point where I dare say it might even replace some of the multiplayer for me. Certainly, I would rather play it solo than a four or five player. Essentially, you have a Automna, which doesn't really care what the color of the resources are, just has a track for them, has a player board, gets uh, tiles and pyramids and that, but essentially has a little, well, I know I say this all the time, priority chart to say what it does at particular times, but there is a cool little mini reference in the book to help you once you've got up to speed with the solo mode. It's not that difficult to learn, and the solo mode actually acts pretty closely to what a multiplayer opponent would do. Because you essentially have one of my favourite things in Autumners now, ever since Viscounts of the West Kingdom, which is a kind of like a priority for what they're going for. So this one I was playing the other night, um, it was the merchant guy, and it prioritises which gods they're after. So in this particular case, really likes the Jaguar god. So most of the actions you find that when they have a chance to activate that particular god, they'll go for it. And it makes the Automna behave in that kind of way. It's basically the same as if a multiplayer opponent was strategizing for that god throughout the game. It's not difficult to operate. It's fairly quick turns. You just have to get used to the whole, oh, so when it's in the region and it moves a worker, right, does it go for that one first? No, because that's the higher priority for the god. And it's got a tile of black, which means it will go over a black city. It's like, there's a few of those things that you gotta try and juggle around, which takes a little bit. But you've got a diagram, sorry, a, a summary in the book to help you. And by the time, like halfway through the game, I was getting to the point where I didn't have to keep checking the rule book too often. It's a, generally a solid solo mode though. Three levels of difficulty. Play this on easy only if you're learning the game. It is an absolute cakewalk. You can practically autopilot it. But if you play on moderate difficulty, it's enough of a challenge where you need to pay attention to what you're doing. However, I also beat that one. So I could probably play this on hard mode and probably get beat but then have to work at actually beating the hard mode. So moderate and hard, I say, is the way to go. Easy if you just want to learn a game. But honestly, yeah. I mean, I could play this game for like two and a half hours plus, maybe longer with like four or five players, and just end up with conflicts all over the place. Or play a solo mode in half that time. And, you know, it takes about, what, maybe not an hour, but you're probably talking a good 90 minutes, an hour and a quarter or something, say, you could do with a solo mode. I mean, you'd have to go pretty fast to get it done in an hour. But yeah, you are talking 90 minutes tops. I just feel like I'd rather play it solo. This is why Superman works alone. Theme-wise, it's 
there, but it's not as strong as you would like. They have gone out of their way to get the artwork to look really nice, to get the setting correct, get the terminology correct, so they have been faithful to the setting that they are going for, so kudos for that. But there's only so much that the theme really strikes out for you. People have asked me what to compare this game to, and to its credit, it's difficult to compare this to other games. It does feel quite unique. But the best way I can compare it is imagine a board and dice tea game. You know, well, the Taiwan Tinsuyu, the Tekenu, Teoji Huakan, and that. Imagine one of those games, remove the dice, and add a bit more color and theme to it. And you get kind of that. It does feel like this belongs in that tea game series, just not using dice. It's not just using a few cards and a bunch of tiles, really. But yeah, I got that kind of feel. Maybe it's just because the setting's similar to those, I don't know. But that was the best way I could find to describe it. But otherwise, the whole you know, area control, bordering regions, and doing this card system, it does feel like it's borrowing mechanics we've seen before from a lot of different games. So there's nothing here that I would consider to be unique. You've seen this stuff before, but it all gels together in a nice little package and makes it good and fun. The rule book is a work in progress, so I'm going to give it a little bit of a benefit of the doubt here. But the setup diagram did not match with what was in the rule book. There were some ambiguous wording on some of the tiles, particularly with some of these building tiles. And I swear, there are a couple of buildings here which don't do anything like the iconography suggests. Now, I'm going to accept that it's a rule book in progress on a Kickstarter. So I'm not gonna give it too many negatives for that. But I do say as a recommendation to the publisher, get that rule book to an editor. You need an editor to look over this rule book because I think with the amount of different little rules that you've got with the god powers, how the pyramid works, how you score the pyramids and all that, you gotta make certain your rule book is on point because if it is not, it's really gonna crush people's enjoyment of the game. And like I say, it was a hindrance for me to get into the game with it but then I accept that you're working on it and it's going to improve. But, you know, not bad at the moment. It certainly wasn't like, oh God, like Batoku levels of craziness, and that's a fully fledged published game. You know, this one was still playable with it. There just were a few times where I'm like, hang on a minute, what? <laughs> it's like, it does go that way. And the, I'm definitely going to need to rework some of the graphic design because some of the graphic design in here just doesn't work. You know, what constitutes a bag? Fine. What constitutes a cube? Fine. And maybe a token. But... The buildings and the roll cards, nothing is really intuitive. You end up looking at a card in the building and not really understanding what it could possibly be. So you're finding yourself having to check the rule book a lot with those building tiles. In fact, and this is what I mean about some of the buildings not doing what the icon suggests, there are a couple in here where I held it up to the person and said, can you tell me what that does? And everybody said the same thing for that tile. It's not what it says in the rule book. It says something completely different. Again, it could just be a mismatch of versions, but this iconography doesn't quite work. Here's an example. The depleted site where they talk about taking one of these production sites and putting it on the calendar. Do you know the icon they use? They use the icon of the two arrows going in a circle. You know, the like continuous circle. Um, uh, what's the word they use? Uh, uh, Ouroboros, you know, the snake eating its own tail, that kind of thing. When do you see that symbol in other games? Oh yeah, for passive ongoing abilities or continuous abilities. It's an, it's an icon that is used in loads of other games in a different way to how it's used in here. In fact, I would say the direct opposite of what it's used to is in here. And there's a few little icons like that. I think you're going to need to iron out those and get the graphic design sorted because otherwise it's going to cause a bit of an issue. Particularly, bearing in mind, these are very small tiles, so it's difficult to actually read some of the iconography on it at times. But yeah, you could look at 90% of these building tiles and not have the foggiest clue what they do. You need to check the book and there's no reference card for them. You get a reference card for the scoring and the god powers and the movement phase, which is, yes, you definitely want these in front of you. But yeah. We need a summary card for the icons, not just in the rule book. We need them as a card or a reference sheet that we can pass around because believe me, people are going to need them. So overall, as I say, this is a pretty decent game. It's got potential. I think there's going to be some fans for this. And I think if you back this, you're going to have a good time. However, those flaws where I do think it does need the rulebook editor to take a look, it is got some like annoying components like the pyramids, and I do wish it scaled better with players, you know, those are kind of irks for me. But the mechanics of the game with comboing the god powers, building up your pyramid, grabbing little building tiles, and of course trying to second guess where your opponent's going to go for conflicts, is still engaging and still good meaty Euro fun. Certainly the god powers are the main aspect of this game, 
and they're my favourite aspect, so it's good that that's the case. Um, first impressions, I'd give it about a 7. I'd say this is good and worth a seal of endorsement in its prototype state. Of course, like I'd have to get the final copy of the game and give it a proper review for that to be a finalised verdict, but... I'm saying that this is definitely worth a look. You know, I'm glad to, I'm glad I've got a prototype here. I've enjoyed my games of it. The solo mode is decent for those who want a solo mode. So David Digby's, uh, you know, done a good job here. And so I, I think this is worth a look, subject to those little negatives that I have mentioned before that you might want to bear in mind. I don't think this is like the best thing since sliced bread, like some other reviewers have said lately, but uh, I tell it how it is. At least ours was better visually. At least ours was committed. It wasn't just a string of. So that's it for me on this episode of The Broken Meeple. If you like what you see, please consider subscribing to the video, liking it, leaving a comment, and consider looking at the Patreon campaign if you want to give the channel a little bit of a nudge. But mainly, just comment on the video and let me know your thoughts on the game. Is this one that you're going to back? Can you compare this to a different game? Have you decided to pull out? You know, I want to know your thoughts. Until next time, you can check out more content on the channel, including the live show I did with The Boardroom Gamer last Saturday. But you can also check out the recent top 10 I did on pre 2000 2010 games that I did previous week as well. Until next time, remember as always, take care and remember it's only a game. Bye for now.